Hello everyone, I'm Matt Wilgress from Arise Festival and I'd like to welcome you all to this discussion entitled Push for Peace, No to an Era of Permanent Wars, which is part of Arise 22, an online festival of left ideas. Our format for this pre-recorded session today is that we're going to have short five minute introductions from each of our speakers on how we build a more peaceful future. And then I'm going to put a couple of questions to them, some of my own and some which have been submitted on the online form from registrants to promote some discussion and action points before we conclude. If you are tuning into the premiere on YouTube, please do say in the chat where you're tuning in from and put your thoughts forward on the discussion. And please also do look out for the links posted by the volunteers, including how you can get a ticket for the whole festival, how you can donate to the cost of the events, and also future events coming up, including the big Palestine rally. Um, joining us today are Kate Hudson, General Secretary of CND, Shadia edwards Journalist and Officer of the Stop the War Coalition, and finally, Andrew Murray, Founder of the Stop the War Coalition, and also author of The Fall and Rise of the British Left, um, which is a book people have, would have read. Um, I'm going to go straight to our introductions in that order then, and move over to Kate Hudson, General Secretary of CND. Thank you, Kate. Thanks very much, Matt. Well, the world is in a particularly dangerous situation. We're facing multiple crises. We've got climate catastrophe. We've got economic crisis, which we are seeing already leading to social and political upheavals. I'm sure people have seen what's taking place in Sri Lanka, and I'm sure that will just be the first of many, many uh, terrible situations facing people across the world. And of course, we still have the pandemic. Why have we stopped hearing about that? So a lot of things going on. But of course, the ongoing war in Ukraine is escalating many of these issues. And in particular, from a CND perspective, um, it's making the possibility of nuclear war greater than it has been for many decades. And I know many, many people are extremely concerned about this very real threat. Um, the possibility of war between NATO and Russia um, has an obvious risk of escalation to nuclear war. And of course, that's one of the reasons why we're so keen on promoting negotiation uh, to try and bring this war to an end. But the nuclear problem is not just related to the war. Over the past few years, we've seen all nuclear states modernizing their arsenals and some like the UK <laughs> is um, are actually being increased. Uh, you may remember last year when the nurses were struggling to get a reasonable pay rise, Boris Johnson pledged to increase the UK's nuclear arsenal by over 40% when he said the nurses could only have 1% pay rise. So that's the kind of situation from our government. But also nuclear use policies are changing too. We used to think that using nuclear weapons was out of the question. It was a taboo, um, that there was a balance of terror because of mutually assured destruction that no one would use them. But now that situation has changed. For example, just one example, uh, former President Trump not only talked about so-called usable nuclear weapons, he actually manufactured and deployed them on submarines in his last year of office. Britain too, in last year's integrated review, when Johnson announced the arsenal increase, it also outlined more scenarios in which Britain would use nuclear weapons, even against mm. states that don't have nuclear weapons. So both this and the arsenal increase are illegal under international law. So add to that, Matt, the situation now, we've recently heard that the US is going to send nuclear weapons back to Britain, to uh, the Lake and Heath Air Base in Suffolk. I mean, things are just going crazy now. So this is absolutely not acceptable. It puts us at even greater risk on the front line in a future US nuclear war. So we just need to get rid of the lot of them. So I think for those of us looking at how we can have a more just, a more peaceful world, addressing the question of nuclear weapons, how we can get rid of them, that is fundamental. And we need to remember that's what the global majority want. Britain is in a very small but powerful minority holding the world to nuclear ransom, and we need to address that and mobilise against it. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Kate, for those words and introduction and flagging up the sort of nuclear issue, which I think is something we'll definitely return to in the discussion. I'm going to move straight on to Shadia now. Thanks a lot, Matt, and thanks for having me on this really important platform. I think looking at the issue of a permanent state of war is so vital and so important, especially with all this rhetoric uh, regarding the Ukraine crisis coming out most recently, indicating that this war is seemingly unending and certainly will be dragging on uh, into the coming uh, months, if not uh, next year even. Um, obviously, we've seen the rise and now fall of Boris Johnson in recent days, but it would be quite foolish, silly uh, and potentially naive to even entertain the idea that Boris Johnson's successor will adopt uh, any fundamentally different approaches to this war. So Britain, after all, is obviously uh, pretty much addicted to the war rhetoric and its foreign policy approach. Um, and that's nothing that's necessarily new, by the way. Of course, we do speak with the backdrop of the war in Ukraine, but the era of this permanent war, which is what this session uh, is all about, is totally uh, ongoing. This weekend, uh, last weekend, sorry, President Zelensky uh, had called Boris Johnson Ukraine's greatest friend. Uh, Boris Johnson, as we well know, led the whole campaign in sending heavy weapons uh, to Ukraine, upping the troops, upping the spending, uh, numerous visits, numerous phone calls uh, to Ukraine, uh, which was obviously winning some fans, uh, warmongering fans, but certainly fanning uh, the flames all at once. And we know as anti-war activists that this is a very uh, dangerous position. It certainly doesn't call for peace. It doesn't see an end to war. Uh, and now, uh, we have Ukraine saying that it's it's uh, uh, building an army of one million equipped with Western weapons. And what is this Western weapons? It's British uh, weapons. It's weapons that we uh, are supplying to the Ukraine. So this is the backdrop of what's going on. And this is what we mean by this permanent era of war. Our government's role in this permanent era of war is absolutely central to what's going on. We were told at the beginning of this crisis that the UK wouldn't even intervene. Uh, look at the situation now, two billion pounds uh, later, military aid, the biggest spender in Europe is Britain. And this all comes amid the cost of living crisis here in the United Kingdom. Soaring prices of energy, fuel, food have plunged more people into financial trouble than the COVID-19 pandemic, which really seems quite mad to even comprehend given the max unemployment, the hit on the economy during uh, COVID-19. But right now, uh, the headlines recently uh, show a total of 1.6 million more households are struggling than nine months ago. Uh, that brings the total number of households in a serious financial difficulty is the phrase, or i.e. poverty, uh, to 4.4 million households. That's one in six across the whole of the population. In real terms, this means people are cutting the quality of their food products, people are pawning their possessions, cancelling insurance, a quarter, only a quarter of people have savings. For most people, what is savings? Most people are living uh, in their overdraft. And of course, this is the marginalised community, the worst affected single parents. It's getting worse and worse for university students. They're unable to buy sanitary products now. One in 10 are struggling to buy sanitary products. Products. And that's the headlines uh, of the day. You'd expect that in developing nations. Now, you may think, why am I bringing all of this up in an anti-war session? But it's all absolutely fundamentally interlinked. In an imperialist country like Britain, all of this foreign policy is absolutely domestic policy. What goes on abroad absolutely affects us here in the United Kingdom. So when the government say they don't have the money to deal with poverty here in Britain or across the United Kingdom, that's absolutely a lie because the money is being spent on these wars abroad. And where do we think the money is coming from? It's not Boris Johnson. It's not the government. It's us. It's the taxpayers. It's coming from our budgets. So I've been a member of Stop the War Coalition since I was 18. That's about 12 years. And I joined when I was a university student. Very much similar conversations were being had then. Obviously, a different political space in terms of what foreign policy was. At the time, it was troops out of Afghanistan. But the same 
principles of what's going on domestically were absolutely the same. Tuition fees were being troubled uh, at the time. And again, the war agenda was the crucial and most pivotal for the government. We've always said as the anti-war movement, it's welfare not warfare. So I think when it go when it when it comes to thinking about the next steps of moving forward, these two things are absolutely interlinked, and we've got to have that as the fundamental tenets and principles of what it means to build an anti-war movement. To bring all of these intersectional issues together to push forward for a path to peace, because our opposition to war and opposition to the militarization of Europe. Uh, an opposition to the increase of defence spending, an, an opposition to the to the threat and risks of nuclear conflict. It's all got to come from us as the anti-war movement. We know it's not going to come uh, from the government. So for us today, it's about thinking about broadening and widening our movement, connecting all these different dots to move on this path to peace. Thank you, Shadi, and I like that. Um... The phraseology of push for peace or path for peace. I think these are the kind of positive phraseologies we need as well as being against things. We need demands for peace. Um, and as Shadi said, if you look around the world today, whether it be Putin's illegal war in Ukraine, if it be the ongoing situation facing disaster facing the people of Yemen, whether it be Israel's occupation of Palestine, whether it be the sort of not in the news at all now, situation facing Afghanistan um, since the withdrawal there. Um, you do see war and conflict all around us, but also, as Shadia said, that's been the case now for like decades. And um, that's something, you know, as we last year we celebrated, I suppose that's a long word, but we marked 20 years of the Stop the War Coalition and um, things more needed than ever. So now, if we just move on to Andrew as our final introduction. Well, thank you, Matt. Uh, I agree very much with what Kate and Shadia have said about the dangers of the present situation and its connection with a wider range of uh, issues. I think, however, what we need to look at as well is how the British political system is handling this or failing uh, to handle it. We have indeed been in a permanent war really all this century. There's been three wars in which Britain has been militarily involved in um, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq and Libya, and several others where it's been directly involved, including in the Ukraine now and uh, uh, Yemen and Syria, uh, well, Yemen ongoing. So war is at the centre uh, of our national life, unfortunately. And yet we're now having, a, we're in the middle of a Tory leadership election, where issues of defence and foreign policy are not really being uh, debated uh, at all, even though the fact that we're in a very dangerous situation with the war in Ukraine, pregnant with the possibility of escalation, that's really hardly been discussed. It is covered by a suffocating blanket of uh, consensus that extends not just uh, across the Tory leadership contenders, uh, but really across Westminster politics uh, as a whole, with very few honourable uh, exceptions. I mean, this is rooted in the illusion that domestic and foreign policy exist in separate compartments, that, you know, class and uh, class struggle, if you like, is purely a matter for domestic uh, uh, concerns, uh, but that internationally foreign policy is a national issue where uh, all right thinking people would have more or less uh, the same uh, attitude, where partisan struggle uh, is reserved for uh, you know, internal issues of the economy and social affairs, uh, but uh, foreign policy is a uh, bipartisan uh, question. Uh, and this is wrong at a theoretical level in the sense that the same class interests that are at work in British society uh, are also connected to foreign policy. Uh, and Shadia, I think, has already sort of touched on that and uh, uh, explained some of those, uh, some of those connections how British foreign policy uh, is bound up with defending the role of British imperialism, of British capitalism, uh, and its privileged position uh, in a world order, a world order which we've sold at the end of the Cold War as being a world order of peace, and has turned out to be uh, everything, uh, anything but. Unfortunately, Keir Starmer exemplifies this uh, bipartisanship. Uh, he uh, has really no criticisms at all uh, of the government's conduct of foreign policy. On the issue of Palestine, he's taken Labour back into a very pro-Zionist 
uh, position uh, and on the war on Ukraine, he is, if anything, trying to be more bellicose uh, even than the uh, Johnson uh, collapsing Johnson uh, administration. Now, I think it's absolutely clear what the dangers uh, are uh, in the present situation. Uh, Kate rightly talked about the dangers of nuclear weapons, uh, and in particular, how talk of their use is being normalised in the course of the Ukraine uh, conflict. People are discussing it as if it's something that could happen and maybe isn't, isn't the end of the world, when literally it is the end of the world. Um, but even beyond, beyond that sort of cataclysmic scenario, we're now seeing calls for British uh, arms spending to go from 2 to 3% of GDP. Uh, that's a, you know, a, a vast increase that would cost uh, tens of billions of pounds uh, at a time when, as Shadia outlined, they're suffering from uh, you know, austerity and the danger of renewed austerity uh, from the new uh, Tory leader, whoever that is. We're seeing that new alliances uh, being formed, the AUKUS alliance in the South Pacific, uh, an escalation of the arms race uh, in that part of the world, upgrading um, Australia's nuclear-powered submarines, uh, and we're seeing the world dividing into uh, rival blocks driven uh, above all by the USA and its uh, project of world, uh, uh, world hegemony. We need an alternative to this, uh, and the problem that we face at the moment in British politics is that the Labour Party, the official opposition, does not officially oppose uh, any of this, although the Labour Party voted against AUKUS and in support of Palestine at last year's conference, but that makes no impact on the Starmer leadership. And unfortunately, the Labour left has allowed itself to be silenced on these issues uh, to a very large extent, uh, intimidated by Starmer browbeat, and that even Tony Blair was able to tolerate MPs uh, dissenting from his uh, uh, foreign policy, as of course uh, very many of them did. Uh, that margin for dissent is now being uh, uh, squeezed and I think it is urgent that the Labour left think about how they are going to find a voice uh, on these matters, because the issues of war and peace are absolutely central right now. They are likely to become still more central in the not very distant uh, future. And any political trend that has nothing to say about these issues, that has allowed itself to be silenced, is really uh, bankrupt. Uh, and I think this has to be grasped, as Shadia rightly says, the answer is to build the anti-war movement, uh, but building it to the point where it can actually start affecting decisions does require, amongst other uh, things, uh, the Labour left to rouse itself from its torpor uh, on this question. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and to our other speakers, and I think some important challenging remarks for those of us, uh, which most people tuning in will be on the from the Labour left, um, on the situation we face in turning the party and how we project that on foreign matters. Um, and I hope that sort of arise for us because people we know we had a very big anti-war meeting very recently, well, two very recently, both with Jeremy, but it's definitely a situation that Andrew's raising, which is of importance and something that we all need to be discussing. Um, some of my questions have been more taken up already answered to a degree so I'm going to sort of slightly change and merge them as I go along but I think the first one is still relevant which is regarding um previous and forthcoming anniversaries so um last year marked 10 years since the war on Libya and 20 years since the start of the war in Afghanistan next year marks 20 years since the war in Iraq um and that's just three that sort of immediately come, that's within the last 20 years come anniversaries that come to mind. Um, my question now is, to what extent have the powers behind these wars and those involved in others learnt or otherwise from these conflicts? And I don't just mean on the one hand, you know, have they learnt to have a more progressive approach to external intervention, because obviously that's not the case. But also how has it changed how conflicts and imperialism and war have been like pitched in the media, what methods have been used in war. For example, the US uses drone warfare in a lot of countries, which wasn't something we we're familiar with behind and so on. And then a second question linked to that um, and linked obviously to the ongoing conflict in Ukraine um, and sort of Putin's continue illegal actions there and the response of Johnson and others, is the um, issue of nuclear weapons as Kate and Andrew have mentioned being put on the agenda, but also how 
and it relates to nuclear because we want to, how in the labour movement and beyond we make the case against this massive push for more armament spending, which is happening here in Britain, but also in places like Germany, which seems to be at the centre of the remilitarisation of Europe, as Shadi mentioned. Um, and really, I think it's something that is deeply unpopular and we could get, the anti-war movement could get quite a sympathetic hearing from the mass of people on how we can sort of drive that agenda through in the labour movement in the current context. So um, that's my sort of starting question. So if people want to come in as they see fit. Shall I have a go then? It's, yeah. nice to, <laughs> it's been longer since I spoke. OK, well, yeah, but, um, big and important questions, Matt. And of course, um, well, they've learned nothing pretty much. Um, but uh, I think some of the things you were talking about there, what, what types of war have evolved as a result of what they've been through and what they've been developing? And we know that the experience of war can change how future wars are developed. So, for example, we know that for some decades, um, the kind of impact of the Vietnam War on US foreign policy um, was that they were going to avoid sending troops because of boys coming home in the body bags and so on. Um, so I think that one of the things we've seen over the past few years is the development of hybrid warfare. You mentioned drones there, but there are very many other ways in which warfare is now conducted. We've got cyber warfare, we've got space warfare, we've got AI and all those things. And it's, it's quite interesting if you look at government documents recently, like the Integrated Review and its associated documents, um, you can see how much spending is actually being made in those fields as well. So sometimes Labour complains that the Tories aren't spending enough on troops and all that kind of thing, but actually they are making up for it in other areas. So we have a new British Space Command, for example, you know, so there's the risk of um, militarization or ongoing militarization into space, for example. Um, we've got a big uh, cyber warfare thing going on, which costs a lot. Um, but linked to that whole kind of, so the sort of new technologization of war, there is also, of course, the whole thing about fake news, and we shouldn't. Um, put that to one side when we're understanding what war is actually about. And of course, we saw that very much with the kind of Trumpian thing, just plain lies and misinformation and rubbishing of experts. You know, that's a really uh, negative thing because it means that people, ordinary people can't have access to correct information to enable them to make judgments about stuff. Um, and linked to that, of course, is the way the media plays this. So when the war on Ukraine first started, you know, 24-7 about it, you know, and 24-7 with the government perspective on it. You know, so people are not uh, from kind of major outlets getting the, the the objective information. And that's why people turn to alternative media outlets and to other international outlets and so on. But that, for me, is all part and parcel of the ways in which war um, is carried out and continued. And, of course, the way in which governments present themselves ideologically, you know, so the US-UK narrative about the great democracies against the authoritarians, you know, that whole thing, which we have to challenge because things are never that simple. You know, there are many, many complexities and nuances and you know, all those kinds of issues. So we need to take all that into account when we're um, working out our strategies for opposing war. Thanks, Kate. Uh, Shadi, would you like to come in on either of the questions or Kate's points? Yeah, I think I just want to develop on what uh, Kate was saying. And originally, initially, Kate was mentioning the the hows of the military war complex from drones and the development of the technology, but then moving on to the why. And that is to do with the media campaign and what is being fed out uh, through the mainstream, but not necessarily just the mainstream uh, either. So we're looking at the different ways in which people are ideologically sort of brainwashed into accepting uh, the war uh, agenda and you can and this is where we learn or should be learning from history uh, not necessarily we are at all uh, as a country as a government but you know if we go back to the war in Iraq it's all about the us versus them this is the the words that were coming out from uh, George Bush and his minions it was all about we can't sit back and do nothing the weapons of mass destruction 
Uh, then in Afghanistan, it was all about let's liberate the women of Afghanistan. It wasn't about the liberation of the women in Afghanistan. Otherwise, we wouldn't see what's happening today. So there's always, uh, a, whilst the, the government are doing what they're doing militarily, there is this huge pillar of of the media and what role the media plays as a weapon of war and then bringing it to uh, the present tense in terms of Ukraine again all the headlines are Putin the aggressor Putin the aggressor and it's all about uh, defeating Putin and we have to think about what sort of media campaigns are being drummed up uh, to try and convince people that arming Ukraine is the right thing to do and pumping more and more weapons into the country is the right thing. And it is to do with debunking what exactly uh, the media is putting out in terms of the war agenda. Andrew, anything to add at this point? Well, I think mentioning the anniversaries, it does bear repeating that on each of those wars, Afghan, Iraq and Libya, the anti-war movement was correct. We were right uh, uh, in the case of Iraq millions of people agreed with us in the case of Libya apparently rather fewer at the time but in all cases those who warned against intervention uh, were absolutely correct uh, to do so and the governments of the day Labour or Tory uh, were wrong now have any lessons been learned well I mean like Kate I think probably the answer is basically no but I think there are two points to bear in mind I do think there's probably still a reluctance to engage in an armed occupation uh, of another country, a prolonged occupation of the Iraqi or Afghan uh, uh, sort. I think those, the fact that both those occupations really ended in more or less defeat uh, for the occupiers uh, must make more cautious. But perhaps the larger point is we are now at danger of a different sort of war. Uh, moving on from wars which one could generally characterise as neo-colonial, to wars between uh, great powers, conflicts between great powers, between NATO on the one hand and Russia on the other, uh, and these alliances that the US is stitching together in the Pacific uh, directed against uh, China. Now, however those conflicts unfold, it will not be like the, uh, the Afghan or Iraq wars. They're, they're wars of a different type politically and militarily. Uh, and I think we need to perhaps deepen our understanding of what that will entail. I mean, the question of use of nuclear weapons is now on the agenda. It wasn't really uh, in Afghanistan or Iraq or anything. So, so there are important new uh, problems. On the question of how do we um, make the connections, uh, you know, or also or, or, or win the argument. Well, I do think the questions of the economic links, the economic consequences of these wars are much greater than they were in the case of Iraq or Afghanistan, where we could hardly deploy the economic consequences for people here in Britain as a major argument, simply because those consequences were fairly small. Uh, but now we're looking at huge increases in arms spending for years and years and years to come, where the social sphere has been degraded, living standards are uh, falling. Uh, and I think there is much more of a connection there that if we were able to break with the war, bipartisan war policy and its consequences, people in Britain would start to feel the benefit pretty fast uh, in terms of the resources uh, uh, released. So, I mean, th there are obviously bigger arguments against war in terms of the uh, 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 death and the destruction, possibly of the whole planet. But I think this economic argument is one that we can deploy. Thanks, Andrew. And I think that the last point, sort of how we build a movement almost around welfare, not warfare, or something similar to that, I think that is a real opportunity. And I think that is the way, like, relating back to Andrew's previous questions about within the Labour Party and the broader Labour movement, perhaps how we can regalvanize some energy and support. I think that is an important point in that discussion as well. Um, for those of you watching on YouTube, please do join the two organisations we've been joined from today as Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament and the Stop the War Coalition. Um, and if you're in Labour, please also sign up for Labour CND as well. And um, for our media partner, Labour Outlook, where you can get a lot of discussion from, and columns from speakers today and others on these issues. Um, my concluding questions, which can also be an opportunity for each of you to add any final remarks, link back to some of the broader themes of the festival as a whole. Um, which is being pitched as a festival of both ideas and resistance this year, um, and also some of the points that you've raised in your introductions. 
So one is, um, as we approach 20 years since the historic protests against the Iraq war, are street protests and movement building in a traditional sense and were relevant to winning peace and progress? This is a question that we get put in in a lot of the different discussions we are having. And the other link to this is what are the possibilities of a change of UK government approach in terms of foreign policy and militarism? Um, including on the ACAS nuclear and other issues, I suppose, that we've mentioned, either from a change of Tory PM, as Shadia hinted to, which hopefully will happen soon, um, or indeed through the election of a different government in the next few years. So that's possibilities for change through government and parliamentary policy, I suppose. Um, so shall I go in the same order? I'll go Kate, then Shadia, then Andrew. OK, thanks very much, Matt. Um... Well, actually, I know people come up with this thing sometimes about, you know, demos, what do they do and all that sort of thing. Um, but if you look at just the last few years, what are the big protests and demonstrations that have really made their mark and brought about elements of change or have continued to a process of change and re-energisation of the movement? There are things like women's mobilisation, you know, around the, the killings and violence against women, for example, Black Lives Matter, um, the protests about you know, colonial statues and all that sort of thing, uh, kill the bill. There are, there are many, many uh, examples of this, and not to mention CND and Stop the War protests as well, you know, Palestinian mobilisations. And I'm sure there's a place, obviously, for doing stuff online. And during the pandemic, Zoom has been fantastic. And I think people should continue with Zoom because it's inclusive. It enables people to participate who wouldn't otherwise be able to participate. You can have international participation very easily. But when it comes down to it, being there with a mass of people collectively at sites of power or whether it's at a, a nuclear missile base or something like that, you know, you can't substitute for that. It has to be part of the package. You know, So I, I really encourage people to um, continue with that and to step it up as well. You know, the, we are entering, if not already in, a period of intensified class struggle you know, and struggle for peace, struggle for justice and so on. So people need to be out there um, doing that. Uh, so what is the policy, the possibility of a change of UK policy? Well, if you had an opposition which was championing something different and which was saying, yes, let's have nuclear disarmament, let's have negotiations, let's try and, you know, Tip, tip the scales into in towards justice, you know, and, and dialogue, then I would say, well, yeah, maybe if we get rid of the Tories, we could have such a thing. But um, unfortunately, the evidence currently is that a Labour government would not bring about a change. And it's been so dispiriting, Matt, you know, from the peace movement over the last couple of years, uh, seeing things like support for Trident reinforced, backing for NATO without question, reinforced, you know, all those most uh, illegal positions, actually, when it comes to nuclear weapons. It's so detrimental to the well-being of our society and the well-being of the population globally. You know, we have to bring about a change. And people in the labour movement who want to see a change, they have to get on board with these policies. And of course, now it's not enough to say, wait for a labour government, because a labour government will not do that unless we demand on that change unless people in Labour really fight for the policies that they believe in, because we know that the majority of the Labour membership has a good position on these things. Got to change that leadership position too. Thanks, Kate. And I think um, something that I'd add personal view here is that's what, and it's something that's come up in a lot of the sessions we're having, is that kind of attitude, let's wait for a Labour government, was wrong under the last two leaders who were clearly more progressive than the current leader. So it def but it, it represents a sort of wrong kind of politics, I suppose, linked to the first question about movement building and demonstrations of it. Does it I think it's it's wrong to look at Westminster for change. We've got to try and make that change as Kate says and then put that into Westminster. Um Shadia, any concluding thoughts from yourself? Absolutely. I'm just going to echo really what Kate has uh, said. But I think for activists in general, it's a question that we often get, you know, what difference does protests uh, actually make? What difference do they make? What's the point? 
many of us activists get that question, whatever the issue may be from, but it's always in regards to potentially the Iraq war. People say, well, you didn't stop the war in Iraq, so what's the point of doing X, Y, Z? But of course, as activists, there is so much of a point to be on the streets. That's what it's all about. That's what people power is, to collectively mobilize, get on the streets, raise the awareness and make as much noise or nuisance or whatever as possible to get people together. And that's what fighting spirit really is. We don't have a defeatist uh, mentality as activists. We're all about fighting back. So yes, the Iraq war went on regardless of the fact that a million people were on the streets, but it's what galvanizes and gives us momentum even today. Of course, we didn't stop the war in Iraq, but what we did do is continuously lobby the British government to make sure that it's not easy for them to wage war in other countries. Whenever they say they're going to do whatever elsewhere, it's always the anti-movement right there on the doorsteps of Downing Street fighting back and making sure that it's not the easiest uh, uh, path for them. So that's our duty, our responsibility, our obligation as activists, anti-war activists to do that every single time. And there's a huge reason why it's so important, as I say, raising attention, but also connecting the dots and making sure uh, that the government is always held to account. And that's our job, that's our duty. When it comes to, will there be a change of approach with the British government? Again, I suspect not, because of course the opposition is not even an opposition. And without that, then what do you really have? So the opposition, again, is on the streets and the streets are public spaces. And that's why we take to the streets. And we are the opposition. Uh, we are the opposition to the warmongering politics in, in number 10 in parliament. Keir Starmer's not doing a very good job of that. In fact, he's doing a very good job of silencing any opposition within the Labour Party, silencing, gagging MPs who might want to take uh, more of a political stance. But now, even within the Labour Party, uh, they're being silenced too. So it's about really trying to give uh, voices to the voiceless, again, taking it back to the streets. I think, you know, the streets is the most important place uh, to, to do that because it's, it's still, luckily, a free space. It's still a place where we can uh, utilize our democracy. But of course, the United Kingdom is becoming less and less democratic as the days go by. So for that reason, it's even more important to keep mobilizing uh, on the streets. Thanks, Shadia. And over to Andrew quickly. Yeah, uh, well, I think uh, Kate and Shadia have given eloquent defences of the importance of street protests, so I won't elaborate on that uh, very much, uh, except to say only one of the forms of um, political struggle that we have, but they are perhaps the one that is most accessible to the widest range of people. So I think that is very important. And let's remember, in, in 2003, it wasn't the street protests that failed, it was the parliamentary system that failed, because there again, the official opposition, then the Tories, supported Tony Blair in going to war. Had they not done so, had they actually opposed uh, him, the war wouldn't have happened. So we have to focus again on the parliamentary uh, situation uh, and the um, prospects of forming uh, a government that would fo follow a different policy in this immensely dangerous environment that we're in. Now, just uh, two or three years ago, we had a, a, a prospect of a government, a Labour government, that would follow a different policy. Now we have gone to almost the, the complete opposite position, where there is no dissent allowed at all, where matters of defence and war and foreign policy are placed in a sort of sacred space where no one can uh, comment on them, where Keir Starmer does not just follow uh, a, a completely uh, pro-NATO uh, uh, pro-aggression line, he has an authoritarian clampdown on anyone uh, dissenting, and he's supported in this by servile journalists like uh, Paul Mason. We have to uh, say uh, that the, the, the point to break this has to come, it seems to me right now, from uh, the Labour uh, left, who have unfortunately, they've not changed their views on war and peace, they've just been silenced about it. And I think they have to uh, really bear in mind, well, the words of a passionario, it is better to die on your feet than live on your knees. And no one's actually asking anyone to actually die. Uh, we're just asking them to, to say the issues before the people are of such importance that we cannot uh, live with your silence. 
uh, you need to find a way uh, to speak up. And if you do it in sufficient numbers, authoritarians get faced down quite easily. Uh, and I, so I think that is something I would appeal to anyone watching this uh, who's in the Labour Party and who, who knows or maybe is represented in Parliament by a left Labour MP, go and talk to them about this. Go and say, we, if we are going to get a change in policy, we need you to find your voice. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Kate and Shadia. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Please do follow the link to Biotech Festival and donate in a chat. Thank you.